Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this final session, final speaker of this session. Um, today, Scott, Scott Trillia, is here to speak, us, speak to us about surviving and thriving when you are overloaded. Okay, Scott, please take it away. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. So my name is Scott Trillia. If you would like to ask me questions on Twitter now or later, maybe later, uh, I'm at Scott Trillia. And we're going to talk today about having way too much work to do and what we're going to do about it. And to get us started here, I want to tell you a little story. It is 90% uh, accurate, and we'll see if you recognize any parts of it. So when I'm having a good day at work, uh, I look approximately like this, right? Uh, I like to lay out on the floor of my office, keep it real casual. Uh, I have an all beige office, like a photo studio. This is normal. And uh, you know, work on my old school laptop and keep my sleeves rolled up, just the right blend between business and casual. But we're not here today to talk about me on a good day. We're here to talk about me when I have too much work to do. So when the work starts to pile up, maybe I look at Jira and I realize that I haven't you know, finished all the tickets recently, I get a little stressed, right? I'm starting to uh, realize that things aren't going well and that calm, casual posture turns into a permanent hunch in the corner of the office staring at my own computer. And it doesn't always get better, right? Sometimes I'll, I'll work hard, I'll try and knock out that backlog, and I'll find that in spite of all that effort, I'm actively going backwards. Somehow the backlog is increasing, not decreasing, and things just aren't healthy. Um, I can't even look my novelty 1960s terminal in the eye anymore because every time I open it up and I look at what I have to do, I realize, oh my God, it's getting worse. This is terrible. My stress levels shoot up, right? And it's not just about going to work. Uh, when I come home, this problem, it follows me, right? Uh, I see the stress when I'm interacting with my wife. Uh, I see the stress when my workout regimen goes from pretty terrible to completely non-existent. Uh, and it even starts to affect my sleep, right? And I'm great at sleep. That's a real red flag. So this is kind of what we're here to talk about today, is when we're in this spot, uh, what can we do about it, right? This path, if it doesn't get better, if it doesn't improve, leads to burnout. Um, and not the pretty kind of Instagram-style burnout. It leads to really ugly burnout, right? This is like Scott's life is in complete shambles kind of burnout. Uh, I come into the office, people look at me in the morning, and they just say, Scott, you look so tired. Um, thanks, guys. So what can we do about it? Um, my hope today is that I can kind of walk you through some strategies, uh, walk you through some stuff that's worked for me. This is not going to be rocket science. If you came kind of hoping to hear uh, you know, the most miraculous ideas from on high, you should not be here. This is not that kind of talk. I want to give you practical stuff, things you can start applying tomorrow realistically and get results from. Uh, there are going to be relatively few adorable kittens, but I hope you'll enjoy it nonetheless. So let's talk through what we're going to cover. Uh, I promised something realistic, and we're going to hit three pretty easy points today. We're going to talk first about noticing that we're overloaded in the first place. Uh, turns out that this is surprisingly hard, and how quickly we notice actually makes a difference for how bad it gets. We're going to talk about identifying our priorities and figuring out out of the whole world of things we could be working on, and maybe especially out of the world of things that we aren't working on, where should we be putting in our limited time? And then we're going to talk about all the rest of that stuff. Whatever I decide that I'm doing right now but I need to not be doing, uh, how can I kind of give that a good home? Um, turns out your coworkers don't enjoy it when you just drop a bunch of tasks in the corner and light them on fire. We want to come up with something a little bit more graceful than that. So I want to say this before we get started. Uh, a really, really big assist in this whole problem space is having a supportive environment. No big surprise. Uh, I've been really lucky at Yelp for six years now to really feel like if I was overloaded, I could come to my boss or my coworkers and be honest about that. And they would support me and figure out something that was going to work for actually making my workload realistic instead of uh, whatever mess it was right then. And the other uh, reality here is that as you might notice, uh, I don't suffer from a lot of sort of systemic biases or, or things that are fighting against me when I want support from the company. Um, 
Now, that's a, sort of a lucky thing in my life and a systemic unfairness about the world, but I want to be honest about this stuff, and I don't want to pretend that this advice is going to be equally easy for all people to apply. So with that said, let's jump on in. And you might be wondering a little bit, uh, Scott, why are you talking about noticing being overloaded? This seems like a little bit of a waste of time. I know I'm overloaded because my life is terrible. We don't need a whole section on this, right? Uh, all I can say in response to that is, in my own experience, this is surprisingly hard. It doesn't seem like something that should be that bad, but the reality is uh, I only notice the fact that I'm sort of snowed in under tasks when uh, I've made bad choices for like weeks at a time. And anything I can do to notice that more immediately is a good thing. So forgive me the slightly redundant section and we'll go through it. One of the things that makes it really easy to just sort of not realize that you're overloaded are things like imposter syndrome, right? We're very good, uh, for better or more likely for worse, at blaming ourselves for any deficiency in terms of how much we're getting done. So you might look at your backlog and say, you know what, uh, I'm behind, I'm not successfully doing all this work, but it's only because I'm so bad at my job. And if only I were better, if only I used the right text editor, surely all these problems would go away, right? Um, the kind of nice reality about this problem is even, and I don't think this is true, but even if it is true and the problem is that your skill set is actually not up to the task, in some ways that's okay, right? If I have so much work and I'm not ready to do that much work and it's not the imposter syndrome talking, guess what? I'm still overloaded. I still need to do something about it. So kind of no matter which way this works out, you still have a problem to fix, so I'd encourage you to not think about this. Um, Treat it like we treat blameless postmortems, right? We try to not go around and point at different people and say, you know what, you broke the site this week, I guess we're gonna fire you. That's, we, I think we try not to do that. Uh, when it comes to thinking about how you're overloaded, try and treat it the same way. Instead of saying Scott's terrible at his job and maybe he should work a little harder, we wanna say, how can we make sure that he has the right amount of work for his current skill set and his support within the company? And the reality is, is that as we try and catch overload, there's a good reason that we wanna catch it as early as possible, right? This kind of stuff compounds over time and it's not gonna get any better if we don't pay attention to it. Uh, if you think about kind of the area under the curve here, unsurprisingly, if you catch it way more to the left-hand side of that diagram, you're in a much better spot and you're gonna just have less work to dig yourself out from underneath. And you really don't wanna hit that knee in the graph on the right-hand side that's when your whole life you know, falls apart and you're in a really bad spot. So we're gonna try and pull our moment that we realize, oh, I have too much work and I need to do something about it all the way to the left side of that graph. So how do we go about this, right? How do I notice overload in my case and how do I make sure that I'm not just uh, cargo culting something that some presenter at PyCon told me to do? Um, I hope that you can all find your own symptoms and realize what it feels like I, honestly, very viscerally, when you have too much work to do and sort of build a list of these so that you can identify things later on. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a few of mine. You may recognize things that are relevant to you, but I'd encourage you to think it through on your own as well. Uh, one of mine, when the same important item is sitting at the top of my to-do list for a long time. Uh, I'll be honest with you, a certain PyCon talk was sitting at the top of my to-do list for a long time, and I wanted to work on it. I knew it was important. But the reality was I wanted to spend time on it, right? I wanted to give it the proper attention it deserved. And so it just kind of sat there and I started doing all the other stuff. And this is a really common failure mode for me personally. And I know it's because I have too many things on my plate right now. Uh, the flip side of that is usually when that important task is sitting up top, what I'm doing instead is the stuff I'm comfortable with. Uh, my job right now at Yelp really focuses on things like uh, building roadmaps for teams and supporting uh, sort of the development of other technical leaders. And when I get sort of overburdened or I'm otherwise distracted, I kind of slide back into the stuff I used to do in my old roles. So maybe I'll start doing some bug fixes because I see them, or I'll start fixing pet peeves in services that I really care about but maybe aren't super important. Um, so I have to keep an eye out for this one. But the number one red flag for me, the thing that always comes up, and this is how I know that I'm really in a bad spot, is the amount of time I'm working. And this is probably something that applies to a lot of us, but for me, I know this is absolutely something to look out for. 
So if I'm working late into the evenings, if I'm working on weekends especially, and if as I go to bed I'm failing to fall asleep, normally something I'm really good at, and it's because I'm thinking about something over and over in my head, those are all red flags. So this is my symptom list, it might not be yours, but build one for yourself. And then the most important part is we want to build a regular routine around evaluating those symptoms. So just because you have a really excellent list of how it feels when you're overloaded, if you never look at it, and this is the default, then you're going to not really notice when it applies. So I do something really simple here. I'd encourage you to start simple, maybe a weekly check-in, writing it down in a text document. doesn't have to be fancy. The point is you just want to try and measure it and try and keep track of it over a period of time. And this is maybe where you're thinking, uh, there's a problem here, right? Some of these things I'm proposing are really hard to measure accurately. And maybe you're getting a sense that, like, I understand how to track ticket velocity in JIRA, but how I track uh, how much stress I'm under at work feels really squishy, and I have no idea how to write that down. Um, I was reading Peopleware, which is a really excellent book, and if you haven't heard of it, you should read it. And I came across this quote that I had never seen before and I instantly uh, really loved and it resonated with me. Uh, Gilb's Law, and it says, look, things are hard to measure, I'm gonna be honest with you, but it's always better to try and measure them. Don't run around saying, ooh, that's really tough to measure, I'm just gonna not. That's not an option. There's always some way you can measure it that's better than literally paying no attention to it in a structured way. So I try and apply this to this problem. And then the reality is you're not going to nail this on the first try. You're going to come up with some symptoms that feel reasonable. You're going to try them out. You're going to see how it goes in production. And you're going to iterate from there, right? This is how we do software. We shouldn't uh, you know, treat this as if we have to get it perfect the first time or else the whole thing's a failure. And you can have the people around you really assist you. So your teammates or your colleagues, if you trust them and feel like this is something you want their help on, they're sort of there day to day with you and they can help notice. Your boss is hopefully someone you can bring this to. Or if you don't have anybody like this at work, maybe you take this home with you and you uh, ask your spouse or another loved one to sort of help you keep an eye out. So we've built this way to uh, detect when we have a problem, but I haven't yet answered other important questions like uh, what on earth do we do with it? So let's talk about that. And we're gonna really focus on this topic of prioritization as uh, the way to attack this problem. We're not gonna focus on sort of trying to eke out the last bit of uh, uh, sort of efficiency from our email workflow. We're not gonna try and uh, treat this as a problem we can solve by configuring Vim just the right way. We're gonna say, hey, we're just doing too much. Maybe we should do a little less. And we're gonna do that by really just asking ourselves, look, I'm doing a lot of stuff right now. Maybe I, I can't even tell you what I'm working on right now. I just know it's too much. Uh, and ask what we should be working on instead. Uh, I'm a, me a metaphor person. I really like visual metaphors in particular. So there's a podcast called Manager Tools, and they talk about sort of the amount of work that I'm doing as uh, a box. It's called a juggling metaphor, but they, they use a box. And this is essentially the finite amount of time that I have to spend in a week. Let's call it 40 hours for the sake of argument and I fill it up with all the tasks that I'm doing, right? And these are different sizes, some things are harder than others, but I fill it up to the brim and that's sort of what I'm spending my time on. And of course, the rub comes when somebody comes in the door, maybe it's my boss or my coworkers or my own brain, and says, hey, Scott, you really ought to do some more work, right? This is a great idea. And so I have all this extra work, uh, what, what should I do with it? How do I solve this problem? Anybody? Bigger box. Bigger box. Wow, that would be great, right? I'll just work 50 hours a week, yeah. No, I mean, what I usually do, and this is a, a pretty like, careful uh, approach, is I usually just stack it right on top and kind of try and balance the whole thing, right? Make sure I don't tip it over, it'll be fine, I'll totally be able to solve this. Um, and this looks silly in the metaphor, and I think that's a strength of the metaphor, because like, you can't realistically do this for a long time. Um, there are a few really basic things that come out of this that I think are valuable. Oops. Uh, one of them is that my ability and time are finite. I can't build a bigger box. Uh, maybe if I'm really, really good at my job, I'll eventually uh, shrink how long it takes me to work on some of these tasks, but to a first approximation, my time is my time, and I don't get more of it every week. Uh, another shocking lesson, if I'm fully loaded and I want to do something new, I should probably remove things that I'm currently working on. Uh, again, this is a really obvious statement, but it's amazing how rarely we apply this to the stuff that we do day to day. And not all tasks are equally hard or equally important. 
some stuff that I've, I've put into my box I need to be working on right now, some stuff is really optional, and I need to think about which is which. So there's a variety of ways for us to look at all of the work we're doing right now and try and figure out uh, sort of roughly what are the tasks I'm spending time on. If you really hate the idea of doing this manually, you can use something like Rescue Time, which is an application. You install it, it'll watch the programs you open and how long you spend on them and sort of give you a cute report at the end of the week saying, look, Scott, you spent 40 hours on Hacker News. I don't know why you expect to be able to keep up with all your work. Uh, I don't like doing that too much, but to each their own. If you want to do it manually, I don't think this is too difficult. Uh, I look at this, the places I spend a lot of time, things like a ticket tracker or, uh, realistically, my calendar, uh, my appointments that I have going, or sort of the tool that you use to push code. And you sort of just roughly get a sense of I'm spending eight hours here, two hours there, and so on. And the real key here is that we're doing a lot of work, uh, but we want to make sure that we're doing the work that's important for our own role. And if we're doing a bunch of work that's important for somebody else's role, we want to make sure uh, we find somebody else that's appropriate to do that. This here is the Eisenhower matrix, sometimes called the Eisenhower box. And it's trying to break down this idea for everything we work on of whether it's urgent, whether we need to be doing it right now or not, and whether it's important. Is this what my role is meant to do, or is it important for somebody else? I'm going to be generous and assume that all the work you're doing is important for the company or the project that you work on. Uh, and it's only a question of whether your role should be doing this or whether this is appropriate for someone else. So this top left portion of the diagram, I'm not too worried about. If it's urgent for your role, if it's urgent for the company and it's important for your personal role, I'm going to guess that you're working on it right now. If you're not, you're probably going to hear from somebody real soon and they'll correct you and they'll let you know, hey, this is both important and urgent. So you've probably got this under control. Um, this top right quadrant is a little harder, right? These are things that are really important to whatever your job is right now, but nobody is breathing down your neck to make them happen. And uh, it's super, super easy for you to just accidentally never work on this stuff. And so it's sort of the sum of these two boxes that we want to pay a lot of attention to, and hopefully all those 40 hours a week that we're working are going into something in this area, and we want to be intentional and correct on that. An old boss of mine, Alex Levy, uh, kind of talked about it like this, and I appreciate this because it zooms out from individual tasks. It says, look, I'm going to sit down and just ask myself, what should my role be working on, right? What are the big challenges? Not the small, discrete tasks, but the big challenges. And then I'm going to pick a few of them, maybe three, four, somewhere in there, and I'm going to focus on those uh, with my time. And then you get to zoom back down onto the individual tasks and ask, okay, am I working on things that further those three or four goals? And this will hopefully capture a lot of those longer tail, less urgent things that are still really crucial to your current role. And what that process is going to do is it's going to leave out a bunch of stuff that you might be working on right now, right? These are things that are urgent. They feel urgent. Uh, your role is maybe not perfect for them, but it's not like you can just drop them on the ground and forget about them. And so that brings us to our final section here. Uh, what do we do with all this work that we've said, I don't think it's right for me, maybe my boss and my colleagues agree, but someone's got to do it, right? We can't just forget about it. And I think for me this is where uh, a really a light bulb moment happened when I realized that I was mentally treating these things as binary. I was imagining that if I filled a role in the past, uh, the only option was for me to completely abdicate responsibility or keep filling that exact same role. And when I say it like that, that's kind of silly. Of course, it's not that black or white. And so I find it useful to think about just the level of involvement you have with a particular task. Uh, I'm usually a little allergic to four-letter acronyms uh, around business or around process, but I actually find this one super, super relevant and useful. So the RASI model focuses on these four traits, and you can imagine these as roles you can have within a particular task or goal or project. So I can be responsible, which means I'm running around writing code or maybe making something happen. There's usually a few of these. I can be accountable. Uh, this is like the project lead, give or take, so it's all on me to make sure this thing happens correctly. I can be consulted. Uh, think of this as sort of someone's asking my expert opinion, and I come in for a little while and aid in whatever they're trying to decide. Or I can just be informed, and this is like an email, right? Somebody says, hey, Scott, we're doing this, FYI, and that's kind of the limit of my involvement. So 
having it broken down like this, it becomes pretty clear that there's actually a few ways you can be involved, and they do not all have the same amount of time constraints. They do not all have the same amount of authority within the project, and those are both good things. So if I had an old role where I was responsible for service testing, and I was also kind of leading it within the team, maybe I did this over the course of a few years, and this is like really my expertise, this is my wheelhouse, uh, I might realize like, oh, my new role really shouldn't be focusing on this. Um, I don't want to leave it, right? I don't want to drop it on the ground because testing your service is still important. But I want to find somebody else I can train up to take that responsible and accountable position. And I want to stand off to the side. Maybe I'll be consulted. Maybe I really trust them and I'll just kind of be informed of what they're doing. And this is going to be a lower time commitment for me. And it's going to give them an opportunity to step up into that role. Uh, and at least for myself, I have to be really careful of accidentally falling into those old roles. Uh, it turns out that if you've done something for a long time, if you care about it, if you're used to working on it, it's super easy to find yourself just ending up still uh, doing those same roles. So maybe I don't want to be responsible or accountable for the testing, but hey, I care, and I'm here, and I saw you do it wrong, so I'm just going to hop in and do it for a little bit. Um, and that's really easy to accidentally do. I think there's a lot of ways to solve this. Uh, for myself, I like something like the Pomodoro system. Uh, not because it makes me a productivity genius, but because my lizard brain is useless and it likes to respond to shiny things. So this is one way to kind of keep it contained. It'll force me to ask as I start you know, each bit of work, like, hey, what am I working on right now? Hopefully I'm comparing that against this list of things I said was really important to me, or maybe I'm just saying, hey, is the thing I'm about to do for service testing more like being consulted, or is it more like I'm trying to be a project lead and adjust accordingly? So find what's right for you. I don't think this is one size fits all, but the goal is to make sure you're doing what you said you would do, not what you're used to doing. And one of the really exciting things about handing off work to other people, and especially about taking sort of a, a leadership position that you used to do and not doing it anymore, is you get an opportunity to grow the people around you. Um, so just because I've spent three years doing a lot of service testing doesn't mean that other people wouldn't like that challenge, wouldn't learn a lot from it, uh, they just need the right sort of fostering environment. They need somebody to stand there and help them out when they get stuck. And this is the role that you can play. And as a side benefit, you're doing less work as well, right? You can focus on the things that you really want to do. So this is a great opportunity for you to be honest, right? Recognize that things are not as easy for other people if they're new to the area, but still set them up for success and you get to work on the right stuff while you're at it. Um, Julie Pagano uh, gave a talk a few PyCons ago about the sort of challenges, the invisible challenges working in tech. And she covered a lot of topics. I recommend you go check it out. But one of the things she talked about was killing your heroes. And what she meant by this was she was talking about coming to PyCon and seeing all these luminaries in the field, meeting them, and just being awestruck, right? There's no way I could do this as well as they have. Uh, I imagine that they were all born straight out of the womb writing C Python. And like, this is not something that I'll ever live up to. I just can't. It's just not in my DNA. Um, and I really admire her point here, which was, that's not true, right? No matter how much it might feel that way, no matter how much it might seem that way, all of us got to where we are piece by piece. We often got to where we are by stretching a little bit and by having people there to mentor us and support us and uh, excel at what we do. So treat all the things that you hand off this way. Emphasize to the people that you're interacting with, like, look, I got here piece by piece. I learned this on the job. So can you, and I'm here to help you get there. So let's wrap up here. Um, I hope I've convinced you that burnout is not good. Uh, hopefully that's also not something you particularly needed convincing of, but the reality is we slip into it all the time. So the core thesis of this talk is that being overloaded, having too much to do, is bad for absolutely everybody. It's bad for you, it's bad for your colleagues, it's bad for the project or the company that you work within. And what we want to do is take an intentional approach to that. Uh, it's not rocket science. These aren't particularly challenging things to apply. Uh, we're just not applying them by default, and it's worth giving it a shot. And kind of the core argument here is that it's worth it to do less. Uh, you're doing too much right now by default. It's easy to slip into a mode where you're not particularly effective because you're saying yes to everything. And if you're interested in kind of a, a management book that summarizes all of these concepts about focusing, uh, Essentialism is a pretty good read. So it focuses in on this idea that, look, you just need to be doing a few things really well, and that's basically what we're talking about when we focus on prioritization. So we want to make sure that we ourselves are doing the right work, 
And we also want to be really uh, sharing and honest with the people that we're around, right? Emphasize the fact that, look, you don't have to just say yes to everything. You can craft the stuff that you're working on to a point where it fits how much time you have, and you'll be better and more effective for it. So we talked about three steps here. Uh, number one, we said, look, before you can do anything about the problem, you have to know there's a problem. And we talked about how it's important to notice it as early as possible in that process so that you can go ahead and react to it quickly and you have less work to dig yourself out from underneath. We said we wanted to brainstorm sort of what we should be working on with sort of the reality behind the scenes being that what we are working on and what we're sort of forgetting or just not even thinking of might really matter. And if we take a step back, look at those high level challenges and then focus back in on individual tasks, we can sort of reorient ourselves and be in a much better spot. And then after we've done that, we're gonna have a list of tasks that we know we aren't gonna work on. These are things that are left over, maybe we accidentally focused on them, but we can't just leave them alone, right? They might be really urgent, they might be super important, and we need to train other people up to take that work off our hands. So whether that's something that you just have a pet peeve about or whether it's really important critical work, finding the right people who want to step up, who are capable of taking on that challenge, and then mentoring and fostering them so that they succeed is a super rewarding process. And uh, for myself, I really like this idea of not having heroes, of, of emphasizing all of our uh, humanity and the fact that we got here piece by piece and everybody else around us can learn to improve themselves too. Uh, I like superhero movies just as much as the next guy, but that's not really the kind of dynamic I want in my team. I want everybody to realize that, uh, you know, we can all make it. And so if I can have you come away with one thing that you do as a result of this, I would love if you really just took a little slice of the time that you put into things like efficiency, into your uh, Vim configuration, uh, into how you handle your email, or try things like GTD, and just focus a little bit of the time on this question of prioritization and of noticing the fact that you have too much work to do up front. I think you're gonna see really wonderful benefits from it, uh, and I know it's worked really well for me in the past. So with that, I'm Scott Trillia. Uh, if you'd like to talk more about this, I'll be out in the hall or down at the Yelp booth uh, today and tomorrow. Thank you all so much.